Well, good morning to those of you in the United States and good afternoon to those of you um, in the UK and elsewhere. On this panel, we're going to talk a little bit about the role of the lawyer in class actions and in particular how that, how that role may vary depending on the jurisdiction in which the case is venued. We have an aggressive agenda. I'm not sure that we're going to hit on all of the topics that we potentially have slotted for today. We're going to begin with a very brief discussion about how cultural attitudes towards class actions may sort of impact or constrain the role of the lawyer in different jurisdictions. And then we're going to move on and talk about the role of the lawyer at a few different junctures in the litigation of a class action, beginning with case origination and idea generation, moving on to class definition, plaintiff selection, then talking about settlement, attorney's fees, and litigation decisions. And we're going to do them in that order. So um, why don't we go ahead and begin, Arthur and David, with each of your respective thoughts on sort of how differing attitudes towards the utility of class actions or the risk of class actions may constrain or impact the role of the attorney. He's also going to say Sure, go ahead. Shall I, shall I start? Right, okay. Um, I'm getting some reverberation, which means that someone needs to turn off a, um, a mute. A mute. Um, uh, um, first of all, is that, that, that um, I, I, I've got to mention hot coffee um, because um, whatever one feels about that particular case or, or other cases that uh, we get news about this side of the Atlantic. Uh, it still has a, a significant consequence um, this side uh, in that um, there has been strong resistance over the years to the introduction of, of an opt-out class process uh, in accordance with that uh, in the States. Uh, as a claimant lawyer, uh, I have fought that for very many years uh, but it still has some effect. Uh, and um, the European Commission, uh, when talking about um, class actions, uh, opting out processes, they've been very careful not to adopt um, the American model. And you can see that, if I may say so, uh, here uh, in the UK, is that we've been very careful not to refer to collective actions, group litigation, as class actions. Um, now, attitudes are changing. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, we now have some procedures that are specifically opt out uh, in um, antitrust or competition law. Um, so attitudes are definitely uh, changing. Uh, and I think it is um, seeing, in part, the litigation process as a regulatory process. Um, because the regulators cannot deal with every issue. Um, sometimes people are a little more worried about damages claims than they are about the regulator. Uh, and it is seen uh, as um, a regulatory issue and it's seen as a compensatory issue. Uh, and and we, I could give a quick example of a, a cartel that, um, uh, that was uh, related to the price of milk. Well, the loss to each consumer for a pint of milk uh, is tiny, you know, it might be two pence a pint or something like that is. But the gain made by um, the cartelists is huge. Uh, and um, the question is, is that a, is that a reasonable way? Um, can they avoid uh, claims because each individual claim is so, so difficult? So we now have uh, an opt out process for that purpose. Uh, and I think that slowly um, attitudes are changing. So let me just say, um, coming from America, it's a very different view here. And um, my background is I have been a public interest lawyer since uh, for 35 years. I ran, built and ran a place called Public Justice, um, www.publicjustice.net. You can look on the web and find it. Um, that only does cutting edge litigation to advance the public interest. And at the end of 35 years, I joined Bailey and Glasser because that's what I wanted to do, get back and litigate. And throughout my career, I used and helped others use class actions to fight 
uh, race discrimination, sex discrimination, consumer fraud, worker fraud, etc. And the reality is um, there are many factual circumstances in which it is only class actions that can make sure justice are done. Justice is done. Um, and as mass treatment of people continues and grows with more and more huge companies or government officials affecting thousands and even millions of people with the same course of conduct, the only way justice can be won is class actions. Class actions are an incredibly powerful force for doing justice when they're properly used. They can be a force for injustice improperly used. But in America, I think that's the mindset if you ask people on the street, yes, there will be some motion of, yes, there are class actions that are uh, based on small matters that shouldn't have been brought. But when you ask people, um, and they say, oh, we need to sue some big company and hold them accountable. The first thing you're going to hear is, oh, we need to get a class action together. And as a factual matter, that is true. Um, in 2012, I came and was asked to speak at a conference um, in the European Parliament and was sort of stunned to hear this perspective that David is talking about, which is exactly the perspective that big business in America uh, the American cha the Com Chamber of Commerce, which is not the government, it is a corporate um, lobbying group, was trying to portray of class actions as frivolous, um, as useless, as only enriching the lawyers. And I was astonished to see how successful that propaganda campaign was in Europe. Um, David refers to hot coffee, which has to, makes me smile because to be clear, it just shows how effective the propaganda campaign is. Hot coffee was about a case that was an individual case. It had nothing to do with class actions at all, period. Um, in fact, the case was a very good case. It was propagandized to be viewed differently than it was. I recommend to all of you a movie, a uh, documentary called Hot Coffee, exposing the facts of that case, interviewing the plaintiffs, showing that in fact it was a very good case and deserved to win. Uh, as much as it did win and maybe more, but that they used propaganda to paint it badly. Um, the best, if, if you want to understand what class actions really do in America and can do in Europe, the shining beacon of American justice is Brown versus Board of Education, which eliminated race discrimination in schools in America across the country, um, eliminated the idea of separate but equal, that was a class action in 1954 decided by the United States Supreme Court. So when you compare the reality of that versus trying to paint it as something like hot coffee, which itself was not a class action at all, it's quite striking. And I think as, as commerce progresses, it is inevitable if the European community wants justice to be done, it's going to be needing more and more opt out class actions, whether you call them collective actions or something else to actually ensure uh, that justice can be done and the most powerful corporations and government officials can be held accountable. So let's let's move to a, a discussion about sort of within the different environments in which we operate. What's the lawyer's job in sort of the origination phase of a class action? Is the expectation that the lawyer waits patiently by the phone or opens their mail and hopes that you know some aggrieved person will come to them with a fully baked idea, just looking for an advocate? Or is the lawyer's role more of an entrepreneurial one to identify injustices and become the architect of litigation that can serve as a remedy? David, why don't you go first and sort of address that issue in the um, UK? Uh, well, the, the answer is that the, these days uh, lawyers are much more entrepreneurial about developing uh, cases. Um, we have to be, we have to act within our professional duties. So there are, are limitations to what can be done in that sort of entrepreneurial way. Uh, but um, it's quite likely that a, a case will be identified. And it may be, for instance, there's some scandal on the stock exchange, uh, misinformation to the market, or there may be a cartel that's uncovered by the European Commission. Uh, and, and we've had many of them. We've had many of, of both. Uh, and from that, um, one develops uh, a case. 
Um, the modern class action law, if I might put it, um, in um, uh, in the UK, uh, certainly in England and Wales, is what I call a, a sort of producer, uh, in that they have to bring a number of elements together in order to get a case going and indeed to get it in front of the court. Uh, and the elements could be, for instance, the clients, the case itself, uh, the law, um, the funding of it, um, who's going to do the work, how's that going to be done, what's the likely period, covering adverse costs, all of these issues make the modern solicitor at least uh, in class actions a producer in putting all these different elements together uh, and that actually takes quite some time. We could see for instance um, if, if someone came to me today and said um, uh, something about shares that uh, misinformation to the market uh, it's quite likely that it's going to take about a year actually to pull everything together uh, in order to get that um, uh, that package together and particularly adverse cost cover funding quite uh, take quite some time the, the machinery is actually sped up somewhat um, we've had the development recently uh, of data breach uh, claims here uh, and those get going quite quickly actually uh, and um, that is where you get a, a usual thing is either Google or something, there's a data breach uh, and um, those that are subject to that data breach uh, wish to bring a claim. Um, there is, uh, we've got a certain procedure that's actually currently being developed or currently being considered by the courts in order to do that. If everyone's got exactly the same damages, uh, then one could bring that as a sort of opt out um, class process. Um, so it's, 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 it's a lot of work and of course it's a lot of investment for the lawyer uh, in order to get all that done and, and it does require some capital uh, in order to do that uh, and then there's a debate about with, with the funders. So uh, a lot of hard work to get a case up might not be successful. I mean you might get to the, 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 the sort of uh, in that production you can't get the ATE which is the adverse cost cover or you can't get funding or you can't get enough people. You've got to go out and book build and get enough people to make the thing commercial. So all of those issues are dealt with by the, the, the solicitor now in a modern class action. And I, I would say this side of the, uh, of the Atlantic, um, that it probably applies not only to the UK, but also to other jurisdictions. Arthur, how does that compare to the role of the lawyer in the United States? Well, in the, in the United States, the role of the lawyer in terms of the case origination and idea generation can just vary dramatically from area to area to case to case. Uh, it can be, there are lots of uh, very successful pl uh, class action plaintiff's firms where yes, every day they are getting called by individual people uh, who think they have a class action or might have a class action. Um, they even in some areas like securities, they have clients who have provided them, here's a list of all the shares of stock I hold. Um, if anything happens, you, I want to talk. Um, it can go anywhere from entirely plaintiff generated to organization generate, generated. There are both um, groups involved in fighting for uh, consumers or workers or uh, uh, women or minorities that will contact the firms and say, we have a potential class action here. Is this something you'd like to be, or we have an issue here that we really need corrected. Can you help us craft a class action to go after it? Two, um, we have cats crawling on the table and is there anything I can do? No, sorry, Michelle. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, the um, two, the notion of there are firms that will generate themselves and say, here is something we can go after. Here's corporate behavior we want to stop. Here's um, some consumer fraud that we see and we have to find out um, how to put together a class action to do it. Sometimes in established areas of the law, people know how to do it. Um, they can put it together very quickly. And since they're not having to go search for the kind of financing that David's talking about, it can happen quite, very fast. So for example, um, in the 
Title, Title IX is a federal statute that prohibits sex discrimination in education. You know, I've done enough of those cases. I can put one together in a couple of days if the plaintiff contacts me uh, without any trouble. On the other hand, if it's a new area of the law or you're not sure about what the facts are um, or the defendant has all of the records and how to even figure out whether there's a case there can be very difficult. And it can take, as David was saying, years um, to find a, the, the right facts and the right law to go after it. Mm -hmm. But um, it can be generated any number of ways in, in America. And it isn't as held up, it sounds like, as it is in Europe and, and in England by the financing issue. I think that's right. And this provides a good segue into the next topic that we're going to talk about a little bit, which is both lead plaintiff selection, so sort of who is the client, but also the selection of counsel who's going to manage the litigation. And I think I'm going to talk about this a little bit sort of from the United States perspective. And then, David, if you want to weigh in, and Arthur, certainly your comments are welcome as well. Um, the way things work in the United States is each class case has to have a single person or group of people who are designated as the class representative. And their role is, um, to some extent, the traditional role of a client in any litigation. So, for example, they respond to discovery requests on behalf of the class. They are expected to review the complaint before it is filed and settlement decisions to a certain extent um, are up to them. Certainly, they always have the right to choose to settle the case on an individual basis. And that um, can be a real risk in certain kinds of litigation where the defendant would be very happy to avoid the prospect of a class action lawsuit and may attempt to buy off the class representative in order to dispose of the case. And in cases where class representatives are not plentiful, are difficult to find, where people may not know their rights have been violated or their individual damages may be very small, that can be a substantial risk to the case, including well into the litigation. Um, and it's something that's important to address in drafting your fee agreements to sort of protect against um, the prospect of a class representative being unfairly bought off. That said, a class representative has um, quasi-fiduciary obligations to the class of people whom they seek to represent. And so it is inappropriate, for example, for a class representative to enter, enter into a settlement agreement that would unfairly privilege the interests of the representative over the interests of class members. So a, a settlement agreement, for example, involving unfair debt collection practices where the class representatives received relief that resulted in their debts being forgiven, but other class members received only a percentage reduction would likely be rejected by the courts. Um, class representatives do not entirely control the litigation. There are many litigation decisions that are ultimately left up to the lawyers, um, more by default than by any explicit rule that says, you know, this is exclusively within the lawyer's domain. There's very little in, in litigation in the United States where a, a lawyer's decision can survive um, opposition from a client, right? The relationship will break down. But there are many decisions that do not require the explicit approval of a client and where most clients um, recognize that the lawyer's expertise will govern. In particular, the definition of the class. And in the United States, that definition, so the identity of the group of people who the lawyer seeks to represent is generally set forth explicitly in the complaint, the very first document that's filed but is often refined prior to the filing of the motion for class certification where the court actually decides whether the case meets the criteria to proceed as a class action. And that class definition decision can um, be really critical in terms of the court's determination as to whether the class is certifiable. In many instances, it's a very data-driven 
definition that is ultimately provided to the court. I know, David, you just spoke about um, data breach class actions. I've certainly done many of those. Much of my practice involves financial services litigation, suing large credit reporting agencies like Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. For a lot of reasons, cases involving large data sets easily lend themselves to class litigation. We often find ourselves defining classes at the end of the day based on a very particular data set. So the class will be defined with reference to, explicitly defined, with reference to a particular set of records that were either generated during the course of litigation, produced by the defendant, or that incorporate clear criteria that were gleaned through the discovery process. And here, um, all of those decisions are ultimately made by counsel. The final thing that I just want to touch on is that in addition to there being um, sort of a, a process for selecting the plaintiff, and certainly at the end of the day, the lawyer selects the lead plaintiff by agreeing to represent that person as a potential class representative. So the court has final say on whether the proposed class representative is adequate to represent the class, and that's actually the term of art that's used here. Um, but lawyers are sort of the architect of who might be an adequate class representative, both in terms of the individual's experience as it relates to the subject matter of the litigation, whether the individual can be expected to appropriately participate, and how many you need. Um, in large sprawling cases, you may need multiple class representatives to represent different jurisdictional interests, different kinds of interests from within the class. Um, and, and that kind of architecting of the litigation is generally done by the lawyer to ensure that the representative or representatives are going to be sufficiently adequate to allow the class to ultimately be certified um, sort of according to the lawyer's vision. Along with that comes the court's role in supervising the litigation and in ultimately approving counsel. So in the United States, the adequacy requirement applies not only to the lead plaintiff or lead plaintiffs, but also to counsel who is selected to lead the litigation. And that decision also can really run the gamut from a single firm has, you know, a brainchild of a case, no one else files the case in, in that jurisdiction or any other jurisdiction, those lawyers sort of hum along with their client, go to class certification, come to the motions proceeding and say, we're smart lawyers, we're ethical, look at all this work we've done, please approve us as class counsel, to a very hard fought battle among scores of law firms to lead high profile litigation that literally may have been filed by hundreds of firms. Um, in the Volkswagen emissions litigation in the United States and some of the big data breach cases, it's literally not uncommon to see up to 100 law firms vying in front of the court to be appointed in some kind of role to lead the litigation. Um, and we can have very complex leadership structures. I'm involved in litigation against Juul, an electronic cigarette company, where the court ended up appointing approximately 20 firms, 20 different law firms, many of whom are you know, national firms with hundreds of lawyers to manage the litigation against Juul. Um, so that's sort of the process for selecting leadership in the United States, both on the plaintiff side and as to the attorneys. How do things look uh, where you sit, David? Uh, well, uh, it's, it's interesting, actually, because um, here we are developing our opt-out system, uh, and you're describing an opt-out system. Uh, and indeed, I've spent mu much, of, uh, much of my career in, in the States um, learning about the opt-out process and how it works and how we might translate it here. Uh, we have a new opt-out process just for uh, antitrust cases or, or competition claims. Uh, and um, we are very much on a learning curve, similar to the States, I think, about certification, for instance, of, of, of the class, uh, uh, which obviously depends on the, the certification of the claim itself. Um, 
lead plaintiff, uh, who's going to be the lead plaintiff, funding. Here, the court will look at the funding issues. ATE, cover, that means cover for the adverse costs. So when the court's looking at a certifying here, uh, which is still um, the subject of um, litigation, we've got a number of cases going on dealing with these issues. They look at those certification issues very similar um, to um, the states. Um, so in development, I think on opt out, um, but we are mainly an opt in jurisdiction. So any, everything other than um, uh, perhaps uh, what we might call cartel work uh, is um, is dealt with on an opt in basis. Uh, I've just talked about data breaches. There's a development there that's a sort of opt out, but generally it's it's opt in. And there we've um, adopted systems, and I've been working on these now for at least 30 years. Um, and um, we have adopted systems to try and make that work. And so one of those systems, for instance, is that when we when we start developing a case, uh, we will seek to pull together a committee of the claimants. And we, we will make that committee the client. Uh, we are very keen to have clients, i.e. people from whom we can take instructions and who we can bounce off ideas, uh, who we can talk about about the funding, all of these issues on behalf of the class. Um, for instance, I've got one at the moment in relation to, to uh, a tax dispute, uh, a consumer sort of tax dispute, and uh, we've got a committee there, I think, of 11. We try and make them odd numbers uh, for obvious reasons, um, and they represent everyone else. And in forming that committee, first of all is we will try and make sure that each constituency within the claim is covered. For instance, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, an equities claim, you might have institutions, you might have individuals, you might have pension funds, you might have all those is, and you try and get them represented within the committee. Um, and you want people who are committed to see it through. Uh, and I have known um, uh, some committees fall apart, they differ about things uh, and they fall apart and, and life beca can become uh, quite difficult. Um, but but you're, you're dealing with that committee. So that's your client. Um, and in terms of the lead claimant, doesn't really matter. Um, the lead claimant might be simply the person named in, in the um, first um, uh, in the claim form itself. Uh, for instance, I've, I've just started a claim um, and I've we put in a big, big class of, um, of um, claimants. Uh, I think we put A to Z travel on it as, as the first one. I think um, I'm not quite sure, maybe because it started with A. Um, but um, that, that doesn't really matter. Uh, it's the committee that matters. Uh, what will happen in the proceedings, uh, in, in opt in proceedings, is if you've got a big class, it's quite likely that the court's going to say, I don't want to hear from all you, I can't deal with 100 people. 200,000, I think the biggest one we had was 50,000 um, in a claim. I don't want all you in front of the court. I want to pick about four test cases, sample cases, four, maybe six, uh, at most 10, and we'll deal with those and we'll use those as examples. And you have a little bit of a debate there as to whether they set a precedence or not. If the court decides in a particular way, does that mean that that binds everyone else? Uh, it is a debate that you have um, uh, within the proceedings themselves, uh, or are they simple sample cases? A slight difficulty with that is you've just talked about in the American system it is that cl claimants can be bought off. Uh, we we try and introduce some mechanisms in which they can't, and that's usually within the committee, within the the association, because uh, we'll have a constitution. We'll try and bind them into it to make sure that people can't be picked off. But that's quite difficult because ultimately a claimant, if they get an offer, they're entitled to say, yes, thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll take that. And that actually is a procedural difficulty that we have. That we haven't quite yet uh, worked around, but 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 we are. So I, I think that, that we've got these two things going along in parallel and very much a system still in development. What's the when you say that the committee is the client, 
What is it? Can you, can you just expand on that a little bit? One of the questions that we got, and I'll just share with you because it was directed to you, but I think it sort of touches on this question. So one of the questions that we received from an audience member mm -hmm. is whether you would advocate for the introduction of a separate section relating to the professional duties of lawyers acting in collective redress in order to make explicit who the client is when there's a large group of multiple clients. Can you sort of, and that's definitely an issue in the United States as well. And there are certain instances where sort of the traditional rules that govern the attorney client relationship simply don't apply in the traditional way in a class action right. case, right? And well, so well, how yeah, does let, that let, work in the committee context? Yeah, I can, I, can, I can deal with that. But first of all, is I don't think you need anything more um, from the regulatory uh, regime that we have. I think it's all there in any event. And what we're trying to do is we're trying, we like to have a client, uh, i.e. someone to whom you can go uh, and say, I want to do this, shall we do this? This is the way this is going. Uh, and particularly when it comes to settlement, you need someone that's going to resolve the case. And what you don't want is, you don't want 50,000 people having a choice as to whether they do a deal or not. Uh, that, that's that's that that there you'll be there you'll be there until eternity if you get that. So what you do is you get a committee, uh, and you form you have a constitution both of the committee and the association. So the claimants will join the association, and in joining the association, they will delegate their authority to run the litigation and to resolve the litigation to the committee, uh, and it will be the committee that receives the unredacted paperwork. Uh, we have to be very careful about putting out, um, uh, seeking instructions from a wide audience. Uh, before you know it, um, with all respect, I, I know that they, they, they wouldn't do this, but you might find um, someone who's actually got some sympathies with the defendant suddenly appearing as uh, uh, on that list. Um, and and all you want to ensure is that actually you've got this closed circle, the committee, to whom you can have open discussion and pass to them every piece of advice, every letter, every document, without worrying about, oh, will that get out uh, in, in the public domain? Uh, and, and it's that structure that has become quite normal in opt-in uh, process um, here and works quite well. Got it. So that that makes perfect sense. It's essentially thinking about it sort of from the U.S. perspective, rather than having the court certify a class and appoint the class representative to represent the class members. And then, you know, we have a whole pro where we send out notice and people can opt out mm -hmm. during the opt in process. Your class members designate the committee. They yeah. they functionally just op, do it through contract what we do through yeah. class certification. Exactly, you're a, you're replacing that court procedure effectively with a contract. Yep, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So uh, another comment that I just received through email that I wanted to address briefly, just to clarify the process for the appointment of attorneys in the United States, is that it, sort of in the middle of that continuum I described all the way from one lawyer who takes the case from beginning to end and is never challenged to the food fight between you know, hundreds of lawyers all vying for leadership. The way many cases are organized is through private, private ordering. And that actually sounds very similar to the sort of formation of the committee structure um, with each committee members, I assume associated counsel or collective counsel representing the various committee mm -hmm. members where lawyers organize themselves. And even in contested leadership, it's very common that there will be a slate put forward or a competing slate where groups of people have agreed to work together under certain terms. Um, I often say that the best part about being a class action lawyer in the United States is working with all of your co-counsel. I also say that the worst part about being a class action lawyer in the United States is working with all of your co-counsel. So, yeah. now, now, Michelle, I've got, I've got a question actually for, for, for you and Arthur. It is this. Uh, when I was young, uh, coming come to the States often to meet the plaintiff's bar, particularly in, in uh, New York, uh, Southern District, um, um, it used to be the case, particularly in securities litigation, that the uh, first person to the court uh, won the prize, or at least was in the lead for the prize, uh, and uh, the result was that, that most plaintiff bar firms that did uh, securities lit litigation 
had a ticker tape uh, for as soon as they saw a drop in stock of about, I don't know, 10% or 15%, whatever it was, is bang, they'd, have, they'd be in the court. Now, now, that led to some disciplinary process, if I remember, uh, some renowned uh, process in, in, in New York. Um, but um, it, it's interesting whether we are developing that as to whether uh, lawyers here feel the compulsion to be the first in or not. I, th I, think, I think we haven't quite got, got, got to grips with that, um, but it is, it is, it is, I think, a, a feeling amongst um, uh, lawyers is, oh, I must get, I must be the first in front of the court. I don't know, I don't know what the position in the States is these days. Arthur, do you want to talk about that or would you like me to? You can take that one. Okay, so um, there was actually some securities litigation reform legislation yes. passed to address that issue. And now the, the prime consideration in securities cases is which client has the largest amount of shares. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that to some degree has obviated the race to the courthouse. But in considering the appointment of leadership in a class case, one of the factors that the court is obligated to consider is counsel's investment and in developing the litigation. And so the way I would describe it is depending on the type of case, being first to file can, and in, in my opinion, should provide an advantage, but only in cases that are truly proprietary, where the lawyer actually had to expend intellectual energy and real resources in developing the case, right? If it's on the front page of the New York Times that um, a major retailer had a data breach, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to put together the complaint, right? It's sitting there in the newspaper. And so saying, oh, I was the first to file out of 300 when they were all filed within a span of five days, in my opinion, is largely meaningless. And I think more, most courts would view it that way as well. If on the other hand, you have a proprietary lawsuit that you've developed over time based on cultivating witnesses with you know, specialized information and knowledge. You file, file your lawsuit and a week later, another firm reads your case, scrounges up a client, changes some of the words in the complaint and goes and files that. I think first to file is very significant, not because of the timing, but because of what it says about the lawyer's investment in the case. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and so, and that, you know, as with everything, there's a continuum in between. And so I do think that here we are very conscious of getting things on file quickly, but I do, we've sort of obviated the, the automatic prize to whoever marches in the door first, which I, I think I, is a good thing. I mean, I, I, I should say, uh, first of all, a couple of things. First of all is that, that there's a bit of a jurisdictional battle going on in Europe at the moment as to who has the best class process. Um, and the competition has uh, recently been between the Netherlands and um, England and Wales. Uh, and we have rather copied each other. And, and now uh, Netherlands has introduced new legislation just making the process uh, easier. Um, second is that, that it is worth saying that, that there are significant differences in the law uh, that mean that the types of actions that, that you get in the States would not be repeated here with any significance. I can take, for instance, we were talking about securities fraud. We have the idea of fraud on the market, which is not that long ago introduced as a, as a claim, um, but it's quite hemmed in uh, in terms of who has liability for it. Um, and similarly, of course, um, we also have difficulty in pursuing the normal target for those litigation, which is the auditors. Uh, we don't, we don't, uh, there are, there's law against us in relation to that. Um, you've got difference in cost shifting. Cost shifting makes a huge difference to these cases. Uh, and, and again, is a, a, a severe restriction. So, um, uh, we may be going down the uh, American line on opt out uh, in certain respects, but there are still lots and lots of restrictions that will mean that we will never look in that that you know look at uh, the the wide scope of American process. 
Um, much a shame, actually, because I do, we talked about hot coffee, uh, also, but I think you have made the, the point is class actions provide access to the court, uh, which would not otherwise be available. Uh, and the funding of them in the States provides that access to the court, which is, with respect to uh, jurisdictions around Europe, is, is lacking here. It's much more difficult to get in front of the court. There are some constitutional change differences between us, but uh, it is an issue. And as I say is, and, and, and I see the time moving along is, as I say is, we are developing the system. We are developing, we are taking on board how litigation can fit into the pattern, um, but we've quite a way to go yet. I think we've got about five minutes left because we started a little bit late. And why don't we briefly try to touch on um, on an optimistic note, which is settlement. Um, so you've slogged through, you've got the opportunity to settle your case. Mm -hmm. Arthur, what's the lawyer's role at the settlement phase here? Well, it's important to know procedurally that how the ground has been set in America, which is that um, while the lawyer and the proposed class representatives bring the case, they cannot represent the class unless the judge finds that they will adequately represent the class, that the lawyers will be able to do a good job because they have expertise and because the client's interests align, align with the class member's interests. So there's not a conflict there. Then they get to settlement uh, or settlement terms. And the truth is in terms of the legal details, of course, the clients aren't going to know most of the legal details. Um, so the lawyers are going to have to make those decisions. Um, the lawyer, basically, if it works right, the lead plaintiffs and the lawyers together make the decisions that are within the client's purview to understand the, the, the details and really advise us to instruct us how to proceed. But I need to be clear, in America, both the lawyers and the clients, the class representatives' duties go to the class as a whole and what is best for the class as a whole and not for any one individual. So what the law provides is if the class action attorneys believe this is in the best interests of the class and the lead representatives, even all of the lead representatives, think they don't like the settlement, the lawyers can still propose the settlement to the judge and it is ultimately the judge's decision whether to approve the settlement or not as being in the best interests of the class. So obviously you don't ever want to get to that situation. And as a lawyer, you try to work your very best to avoid it and the clients don't want to get there either. I've never been in one of those situations, but I've seen them. And, um, sometime, and there will be class actions where the settlements will be approved over clients' objections. Um, because the judge agrees it's in the best interests of the class, but ideally it's all done together as it would be in private, in individual litigation. We both agree the difference in the class action is in individual litigation, the individual plaintiff decides and the judge doesn't have to approve it usually um, and the lawyer doesn't ultimately control it. In class action litigation, once the lawyer has been made the class action attorney for the entire class, Bottom line is the lawyer, if it come, push comes to shove, can decide here's what I believe should be the proposed terms of the settlement and submit it to the court, even over objection from the named representative and the judge ultimately makes the decision. Uh, and then in David, one respect, I'd like to, oh, sorry, Arthur, go ahead. I was just gonna say one question was asked, are we moving towards class members voting? And the answer is no. But we are moving towards, I think, class members being able to get, because it's not a popularity contest, it's, it's the judge's decision what will fairly and adequately uh, serve the class and is in the best interest of the class. It's possible it might take input from class members. That's what Judge Weinstein did decades ago in the Agent Orange litigation. But um, typically, there's now increasing getting money to people is starting to happen through electronic means but not voting on whether to approve the class action. Mm -hmm. yeah. David, I know that we're, we're short on time here, but I'd like to give you the last word, although I think- about, I don't know about, about the, the last one. one. One is that uh, in our opt-out process, we've yet to see, I mean, the court will have a part in the 
settlement in an opt-out process. But as I say, early days, uh, it's yet to be seen how that will all work. As far as the opt-in is concerned, uh, as I say, is that that is a decision made by the committee acting under their contractual authority from the remainder. Uh, and um, we, in our professional duty, uh, if an offer comes in, we will say to them, we will advise them whether they should accept it or not. Um, and then there's a debate um, within the, the committee uh, and, and hopefully they accept the advice either to reject or to, to accept uh, whatever it is or go back with another offer in the usual sort of way. It might be indeed a mediation. I mean, I've, I've, I did a, uh, in, in the uh, recent case, cartel cases, we had, a, we had a mediation that lasted a year and a half uh, and eventually came to conclusion. But um, it's at that stage is we'll take instructions uh, from the committee and hopefully we come to a, a resolution. I see Florian has rejoined us and I think that our time has run out. Um, so thank you both for participating. I'm not sure, Florian, if I should turn things over to you or what the next step is here. Have we got Florida? Looks like we had him. Let's see. Oh, well, if, if Tika Here hasn't come back, I had to click twice. I came in and out at the same time. I did the whole checkout trick, David. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. That was quite interesting. Um, you should have seen the numbers on the side of people uh, going up in the interim. So uh, there was clear interest from the audience. Um, and we wish everyone to continue networking, asking more questions. I see there's some questions on the side as well uh, on the chat. Feel free to, to ask them directly to, to Michelle, Arthur, and David. Hopefully, they'll stick around for a bit longer uh, and, and answer those questions after uh, panel discussion uh, six as well later on today. Thank you, guys. The break this time will not be as long as the other ones. Look forward to see you in the next panel in just a few minutes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.